The topic this evening is about the settlement of Hans Peak, the death of Joseph Hahn, and a few little tidbits of, like I said, shady and nefarious behavior. Um, we start with the gold rush uh, into Northwest Colorado. Now, we have a lot of terms from that type of activity. You can strike it rich, because a gold strike. Uh, you can hit pay dirt, hit the mother load. There's the El Dorado and a big bonanza. All come from gold rushes and the legends and the lure of gold. Now, gold fever created a lot of movement in the United States. Most of you are familiar with the um, Anglos going to California in 49. Colorado was originally settled by uh, the gold miners arriving here in 59. The Dakotas were Indian territory, and they were settled around 74 with the gold rush. And then the last big gold rush in the Klondike in the Yukon was in 96 to 99. Interestingly enough, though, all of the gold uh, rushes coincide with a financial crisis and panic or a recession in the United States. So not only were people looking for an opportunity to own gold and be rich, they were also doing it at a time when they didn't have a lot of other options. So it made it sensible for them to go and try and find something to create a better life. Joseph Hahn was the, one of the original prospectors in Northwest Colorado. He came in and lived for a while in Georgetown, but he, was an, he emigrated from Germany by way of Sweden, and he arrived in the United States in 1854. Um, he was considered to be a genial man, there's not a lot written about him, but he apparently was blue-eyed, about 5'10", uh, had a stocky, powerful build, about 175 to 180 pounds. Um, he ended up around the Georgetown area, and then he started prospecting near Old Baldy. Hans Peak was originally called Old Baldy, and there, um, if you've ever seen the mountain, you know why. The top of the mountain is bare, rock. Um, the timber line on that mountain is one of the lowest in Colorado because the peak is only 10, 8, I think. Um, the timber line is usually higher than that. Anyway, in an 1820s survey, there was some written information about Old Bald, which was the original name. So Joseph Hahn ended up with a peak name for him the first town in Northwest Colorado, and it was the lure of gold that brought him to the region. But it was also this lure of gold that caused his death. In 1862, he came over from George, uh, Georgetown area and found color. In mining terminology, color means that you have found gold. Um, in 1863, he returned to the Hans Peak Basin with some friends and found gold at a place called Willow Creek. Now, Willow Creek still exists. Um, it now empties into Steamboat Lake at the, at the State Park. But if you pass uh, on 129, if you pass the park headquarters, pass the firehouse, and take a left as if you're going to the marina, you drive right across Willow Creek, which was the creek where they discovered gold. Um, the Civil War interrupted some of the gold seeking because he's found gold in 63 but doesn't return for a while. We do know that one of his partners, Captain George Way, served in Company M of the 3rd Colorado Cavalry during the war. And it's um, suspected that possibly Han and their other partner, Doyle, also might have served in the Civil War. Anyway, the Civil War went from April of 61 through April of 65, and in the summer of 65, Han, Way, uh, and William Doyle head back up to Willow Creek. They find good color and gold nuggets, but they return back to the front range of Colorado 
and keep quiet about it because they don't want to give away their striped location. Um, while they were there in that summer of 65, Doyle and Way climb Hans Peak um, and take with them a, a yeast or baking powder tin that had a screw top. And in it, Way had written, we climbed this on August 27th and are naming the peak for our friend Joseph Hunt. It was old, old, old Baldy and is now Hans Peak. Um, on the note that he wrote, though I'm not sure that the can was ever found, Doyle was interviewed in the late 1800s and told the story about doing that and what date that they um, named the peak Hans Peak. Hans Peak is spelled without the correct apostrophe for Hans' ownership of the peak. Um, partly because when it was registered, the town was registered with the state of Colorado, the apostrophe was not in it. So we get lots of people coming up and saying, don't you know there's supposed to be an apostrophe in that? It's like, yeah, we know that, but the people named the town apparently didn't. So they keep quiet about their discovery until the following spring. And then they hand pick an expedition of about 40 prospectors to go back with them over the mountains to the Hunsky Basin. Um, it wasn't just anybody who wants to come. Um, they knew somebody or you knew somebody to get into this expedition. Uh, along the way, a few days out of town, they picked up about 10 more prospectors, people they knew, and that was to become important because one of the prospectors, Charlie Utter, helps them out that summer. Some accounts say they left um, in May. Some accounts say they didn't leave until July. Regardless, whichever time they left, on the way in, these 50 men were buried by a blizzard as it came into the mountains. They actually had to, they had to pack out the trail for the horses to get through. So they were all packing and making a trail so that their horses and the pack animals could get through. It was then Summit County, back in 1861, Colorado only had 17 counties, and they came in from Empire to Georgetown over Bertha Pass, which at the time was named Bridger Pass, came over almost to Kremlin, but not quite, and then uh, climbed Buffalo Pass over into near the Park Range and Hans Peak. In that summer of 66, they established Hans Peak Mining District, and Hans Peak claims that it's the first mining district in Northwest Colorado. That's if you decide that Hot Sulphur Springs is in, not in Northwest Colorado. It's in the middle part, so it's in the middle of the mountains. So our museum claims the, the, the first um, mining district in Colorado. Uh, the three partners, Doyle, Hahn, and Way, got double shares, and they were um, the officers of the mining district, and all the other men got a single share. They took turns building cabins and mining. At that point in the summer, Colaro is the chief of the top, top of the mountain use, and he's concerned about all these people in his hunting area, and, but he knows Charlie Utter, one of the prospectors that was added, or added at the last minute. And Charlie reassures him that they only want the gold, they won't take the land. Um, and if we're talking about nefarious or shady doings, that's probably the most shady um, land grab. In fact, the Dakotas were taken that way from the Indians. So um, within about 10 or 15 years, the Utes have lost uh, all of Colorado except a small reservation in the southwest tip of the state. Actually, the Treaty of 1863 had given all this land in, North, uh, in Western Colorado, not just the Northwest, but in Western Colorado, to the Utes in perpetuity, which lasted about 10 to 15 years. 
Well, that fall, in 1866, the more sensible man in the party headed back over to the front range because they knew how wicked the winters were in northwest Colorado. But Han, Doyle, and Way were still struck with gold fever, and they decided to stay. They obviously got well thought out. They had a cabin, but they didn't bring in any supplies. They didn't get any of the natural resources. Um, there were plenty of berries. The yampa root that the Utes ate was very plentiful in the area, and there was a lot of big game. But as you all know, the game moves to lower elevations when winter comes. So they stayed to uh, cross-cut lumber so that they would have lots of lumber for their mining operation when everybody else came back in the following summer. About October, they realized this is not working out really well. And Way heads out back over to either Empire Georgetown or Front Range to buy some plots. And he says, well, I'll be back in about two weeks. He never made it back, but he didn't die either. And there's no record of why he didn't, um, why he didn't come back, uh, what happened. Um, he and Doyle never spoke about it, and so we don't know why he didn't show up. And I don't know when the good halfway time is for another drink. Five more minutes? All right. Um, so Wade does not return, and so that spring, they're starving to death. All they've had to eat all, most of the winter, is shows and snowshoe hair. Um, the reports just say rabbits, but my husband's a wildlife officer, and he said those rabbits are snowshoe hair. Um, so in the spring, they decide they better head out because they're not going to make it the rest of the time. So on April 22nd in 1867, they head out back toward civilization, what they call it, civilization. And again, they're buried in a blizzard. There's a huge spring blizzard. Um, they get lost. They're very disoriented. They end up somewhere close to Kremlin, which is part of the way that they needed to go, but the one evening they lie down to go to sleep, the next morning when they wake up, Han is alive, but he is too weak um, to get up. So Doyle wanders around trying to figure out where they can go or how to get out of the situation. He comes back to the camp and discovers that Joseph Han has died. Now, we could say the blizzard killed him, or we could say that a fever killed him because of the bad choices he made due to the gold fever. He put himself in an impossible situation. So the lure of gold brought him to Colorado, and the lure of gold is what ended up killing him. So I'm going to make the break right here because it's a better time and um, go get some beer <laughs> um, at the bar. So we might as well go back again. A few people mentioned, which I didn't intend to do, but it was a good idea. I just do better than intend to do it. That I left you at a cliffhanger. <laughs> you don't know what happened to William Doyle. So he comes back and finds um, Joseph Hahn dead. So he starts wandering around again, trying to get out. He's snow blinded at this point, and he ends up sort of close to Kremlin, and some cowboys that are out looking for strays find him and take him back over to Hot Sulphur Springs. Um, that area is not a mining area at the time. The rancher from Hot Sulphur Springs actually, not that summer, but the following summer, sends someone up to bury Joseph Hahn. Um, he is buried by Muddy Creek, which is kind of behind Walford Mountain by the Walford Mountain Reservoir. And if you're interested in that, my husband was trying to explain to me where it was, which behind Walford Mountain was good enough for me. 
but um, he, he could give you more information about that. Um, a friend of ours that lives in Hot Sulphur says he's been in that area and he thinks there's still a card or something that um, marks the grave. So, from 1967 to about 1867 to 1874, there is not a big um, rush in Northwest Colorado. There are a lot of long prospectors, a lot of people going out with their, um, their burrow or their horse, a pick, a shovel, a pan, um, a rifle, and I wrote something else down, I think it was. Anyway. Um, and they uh, basically found most of what they would call loose gold. It had pretty much been picked over by about 1874. Mining at that point became more expensive. It's still placer mining. Placer mining is when you mine using water to separate the gold from the dirt. You guys all know about panning where they put the dirt in the pan and swirl it with the water and the heavier gold settles down to the edge of the pan. That's plaster money. But once the real easy surface gold is gone, they needed to start plaster mining using equipment. In order to buy equipment on a large scale, they had to form some type of consortium or company uh, and get investors so that they could buy the equipment. So in 1875, a man named Charles Farwell, who's a wealthy businessman from Chicago, comes out and buys up six of the planes um, in that area. He bought Hans, Doyle's Ways, one called Virginia, and one called Nova Scotia plane. And from that, he started something called the Centennial Mining Company. It wasn't actually incorporated or named until 79, but it was in business. And Farwell was a pretty religious man. So he set up his camp at something that he called International Camp. It had a reading room, they had magazines and newspapers. And remember, this is in you know, late 1800s in Colorado. The closest railroad is Walcott or way up in Wyoming coming out of Laramie. They're still coming over from the Front Range. Uh, Steamboat, I think, is settled, starting to be settled by them, but this is still pretty rough territory. So I thought it was pretty impressive that Farwell would um, provide newspapers. He had a chapel. They had a Sunday service. They had a, a Sunday school or instruction. And the dinner bell that called all the miners to dinner also was used on Sunday for the church service. There was no alcohol, no dancing, and no saloons. So this is not the underbelly. <laughs> um, however, one mile west of um, Farwell's camp, which actually was called by the miners Bug Town. Now, living in Colorado, I instantly thought mosquitoes. But Bug Town was the nickname that the miners gave it because the big bugs, or the executives, lived at the international camp. So, meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, one mile west, a town is starting to develop in an area called Poverty Flats. It was a wide open town. It was considered free land. It wasn't that the land, um, you know, you could stake a claim. Why it was free is it was not land already owned by Farwell's company. And if you guys are familiar with the area, there's a mountain close by there who is, that's named Farwell Mountain. That's about all he really got out of it was the name of the mountain. So Poverty Flats has gambling, saloons, and wild women. And guess which one is still in existence? On Peak and Poverty Flats or International Camp and Bug Town? So of course the Wild West town is the one that continued to in existence. 
Um, during the four years or so that Farwell was involved with his mining uh, company, he had a man named Robert McIntosh design and build something called the Big Ditch. Now this was a really big ditch, it was 27 miles long, came from the North Fork of the Elk River, and using gravity feed only, came from the Elk, North Fork of the Elk River all the way down into um, what's the present village of, of Hans Peak. That's where Poverty Bar is. Um, well actually, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. It only came to international camp. Um, Robert McIntosh is called Big Man. Um, I'm sure he wasn't the original Big Man, if you think of all the Scottish families and people who have Mac in their name. But he was a Big Man. And this 27 mile canal had hand formed iron pipes, had wooden pipes, had wooden flumes, um, and those are still available for you to view at the Hans Peak Museum. Uh, the way Can Candace contacted me for this is that I'm a member of the Hans Peak Historic Society. And we have a uh, schoolhouse, the museum, an interesting jail, and a building called the Pole Barn that sits on the foundation of the stable that was there for the uh, school children's horses. And in that are uh, quite a few remnants of the big ditch and mining equipment. Well, in December of 79, Farwell has really not made any money in this. So he sells the corporation, I call it a corporation, I don't know it's a it was a mining uh, company, and he sells it as a loss. Now this is where the shady dealings come in. <laughs> Rumor has it that String Ridge, with all the claims that Farwell bought, might have been salted. Now, in mining terminology, when something is salted, it's kind of like you salt food and you get all these little nuggets or whatever of salt. Well, when you salt a mining claim, um, it could be gold, it could be diamonds, it could be anything, but someone strategically goes out and places gold around, so it looks like this would be the area of a really good big strike. So he goes back to Chicago without having made any money, and Big Mac Macintosh purchases, purchases the um, mining company from him. Well, Macintosh knew something more than Farwell, and maybe it's, I think he was an engineer, so um, gold is often found where there are big quartz outcroppings, um, and also if you find little garnets around, I'd be happy with the garnets, but anyway, if you find garnets in the dirt and whatever, it's a pretty good bet that gold has washed down into that um, part of the dirt. So he extends the ditch further around the corner um, into Poverty Bar. Now, there's a trail that you can hike on yourselves that is across from the state park. If you go to the state park headquarters, um, just across 129, the highway, is a trail that's called um, the Property Bar Trail. It goes up behind Hans Peak, and in the summer, you can see what is called the Rock Wash. Um, the plaster mining that they were doing was still washing dirt with and washing the gold out, but they were using great big nozzles, almost like a hydraulic nozzle, except that the water was gravity fed, and then by being forced through these smaller metal nozzles, created uh, some good water pressure, and they were uh, removing the dirt from the side of the hill and pulling out gold. Now, Poverty Bar ended up being the biggest and richest um, mining endeavor in the Hans Peak Basin. In one six month, no, excuse me, six week period, they pulled out $60,000, which in today's money is $1.5 million. That was one six week period. Sometime between 80 and 81, because those were the peak years for mining in Hans Peak. At the end of the century, that part of Northwest Colorado um, 
had mined 500 to $600,000 worth of gold, which in present um, inflated prices would be over $13 million uh, in gold from the Hanski Basin. Um, something I was reading today said that gold was about $18 an ounce back then, and now it's somewhere around $1,300 an ounce. Um, I actually did some research on it a few years ago for another talk, and actually did it based on inflation. So I don't know, I'm not as familiar with the price of gold, but um, they took upwards of over $13 million out of the Bunsby Basin. Macintosh somehow gets bored with this endeavor, and he sublets the mine. So he's still making some of the profit, but he wanders off and does a lot of other things in Colorado. He actually ends his life um, breeding horses. I was supposed to get out of gold to that pretty nice horse breeding operation, but he ended up breeding horses. So Hans Peak had the first mining district in northwest Colorado, had the first town in northwest Colorado, had the first paying industry in northwest Colorado, because um, of course Farwell paid his miners. Um, it had the Hans Peak had the first post office. It still has the oldest cemetery that still continues use um, right before you get to Hans Peak. The first Anglo child born in Northwest Colorado was born in Hans Peak, and he was a wither. Those of you who know this um, history in Stingle Spring, the wither family is very prominent. They actually started um, up in Hans Peak as they, they uh, as I said, trucked, but they don't truck. Um, they brought goods in from Walcott by wagon, um, canned goods, food, general store items, up to Hans Peak. Um, now, Colorado achieved statehood in 1876. That was delayed partly because of the war, and most of you are probably Coloradans and know that we're the centennial state, because 1776 and 1876. But in 1877, the first election in that county was held, and at that election, Hans Peak is chosen as the county, county seat. Now, at that point, Grout County is a huge county. It goes all the way over to the Utah line. It's what is presently Grout County and Moffat County. Um, it had a courthouse, it has a, uh, a jail called the Bear, Bear Cave Jail. And Steamboat Springs is in competition with Hans Peak at the end of the century because Hans Peak is growing, I mean, excuse me, Steamboat Springs is growing and Hans Peak is what they call panned out. There's still mining there, but um, it's not very prosperous and the town is slowly um, sort of dying. Steamboat Springs finally manages to become the county seat in 1912, and that's because the state of Colorado divided the counties. So it divided into the Route County and Moffat County. Steamboat Springs was bigger than Hans Peak, and so they became the county seat, um, Hayden, Craig, and all those places that had voted for Hans Peak now had their own county to deal with. The Bear Cave Jail was then moved to Steamboat Springs. And the Bear Cave Jail is really interesting. It actually has iron bars, uh, has two, what would you call them, uh, cells with, with a bed. It doesn't look terribly comfortable. But um, it is in Hans Peak now at the back of the museum. You, you, it, we're open in the summers, basically about the second weekend of June all the way through Memorial Day, um, noon to four, seven days a week. And you can see the Bear Cave Jail. It's actually moved to Steamboat Springs and incorporated into the Steamboat Springs Courthouse. We moved here in 1975 and the jail, part of the jail was this old Bear Cave Jail. Um, a friend of ours just told me tonight that it was finally removed and given back to Hans Peak when the new judicial building and the jail were built. 
but before that, um, it was part of the jail in the basement of the courthouse. There's actually a sign down there close to the, uh, is it the clerk and recorder's office? Um, there's a sign in the hallway that shows where the Bear Cave Jail um, was housed. And one reason I bring it up is that there's a book, I think the museum here in town has it, the museum is, um, Hans Peake has it, a book called Lant and Tracy. And it's Hans Peake's only famous outlaws. Um, David Lant and Harry Tracy are jailed in Hans Peake. Um, they overpower the sheriff in the evening, and they're discussing whether they're going to kill the sheriff before they take off. Harry Tracy wants to kill him, and David Lamp does not. And the sheriff isn't really knocked out. He's playing possum listening to them and talking about this. So they head out back down to Steamboat Springs, planning to take the stage the next day. And the sheriff, of course, jumps right up, gets a posse together, and they go down. And in the morning, as the stage leaves Steamboat Springs, they apprehend the two outlaws. Now, Harry Tracy continued his life of crime, and David Lant really has never heard of again. And he's the one that didn't want to kill the shit. So, um, they were housed in the Bear Creek Jail, Bear Cave Jail, up in Hans Peak, and I guess you'll have to come next month to find out the rest of that story. 